and welcome to the Creative Constitution podcast. Today I'm joined by Willem Neal, an amazing filmmaker, director, and now animator. So y- much. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, a little yeah. bit. Working on that. Yeah. <laughs> and today's episode is all about leadership skills for directors. So welcome, Willem. How are you? Yeah, I'm great, Deb. It's great to finally be here. Yes. Been talking about it for a while, so it's yeah, finally it's nice so to actually, good. yeah, be on here and um, yeah. So help excited. You out with it. Well, so to start us off, I'd love to sort of know your background because you haven't always been in films and making films yourself. So mm. I just, I'd really like to sort of touch on your background and where a film came in. Yeah, for sure. So I'm, I'm pretty late to the industry compared to probably some other people um, because I originally served in the Air Force. I was, I was an Air Force officer for 11 years mm. um, and I did that straight out of school. I went to the Defense Force Academy, um, which is sort of like the university, a military university. So I did a degree there and, and went through a, a number of different officer training schools and uh, different units and things like that. Wow. Um, so, yeah, like I, I was, I've been exposed to a lot of um, very different sorts of scenarios and environments and people and, and, and things like that, which I think have um, kind of, you know, so far served me pretty well transitioning yeah. into the film industry. Definitely. Um, so, so a lot of the stuff that I've picked up, I guess, like over the years, you know, not obviously not so much like the military specific things, but, you know, certainly the leadership stuff and the managerial skills and uh, just general mm. social maturity has, has, has sort of informed um, so much already of um, yeah. my, my being on the film set. And uh, yeah, and it's one thing that sort of struck out to me is the parallels that you can draw between, you know, leading a rifle flight or an infantry platoon, Mm. um, both things I've done. And, you know, then applying that into a film set, which you don't think, you know, on the- You don't think that they're connected. No, no. no, And, and, you know, in a lot of ways you'd be correct in thinking that, but it's the, the, again, like those leadership skills and those those, um, parallel- uh, tools and mindsets that can be applied to uh, a film set, particularly in, you know, a directing seat yeah. that, that really kind of stuck out for me. For sure. And and with sort of the background that you have working in that sort of environment, what was sort of the the reasoning for getting into film after you sort of left that? Um, where does Where did the film sort of really... Kind yeah, of the, the, you know, the magic kind of sort, of sort of came and called for it. Yeah, well, look, I've always had a bit of a creative bone in my body, but more than a bit. It's like, it's huge. And it came out in various ways of me growing up with, you know, speculative storytelling and ideas and things like that. And even through school, you know, I've always considered some kind of creative pursuit uh, generally with film, you know, there were most, I remember from an early age, I really wanted to do cinematography because mm. I thought, you know, cinematography is really great. I watched Saving Private Ryan when yeah, I was, oh, such a good, right? such a great it's, movie. it's a, it's oh a landmark. God. And, um, I remember thinking, wow, like the pictures look so cool and it'd be so great to do something like that. Uh, and then, you know, that goes into the back of my mind and I forget about that for a while. And, you know, I thought maybe, oh, producing, you know, like bringing other things to light, you know, because, I don't think I have the technical expertise yeah. for that and all of those sorts of things. And then eventually it landed on writing. So I, um, when I, when I, uh, deployed to the Middle East, when you deploy to the Middle East, you have a lot of downtime, uh, mm. you know, cause you don't have to do commutes and you don't have to cook dinner and things like that. And so it just kind of worked out well that at the time I really wanted to try writing a novel. And so I yeah. used that downtime to write uh, a fantasy novel, you know, doing a thousand words a day straight out of Stephen King's how to guide. A thousand words a day. Yeah. That's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it doesn't need to be a thousand words, but that's just what worked for me. Yeah, and you have that habit. Yeah. It's yeah. just settling into the habit and just hitting that quota, especially, you know, for a first draft and all, but you know, Hey, we're not here to talk about writing, but <laughs> that, uh, I guess was the snowball that, um, made me realize that that my creative pursuit is something I want to do for the rest of my life, you know? So, um, wrote the novel, published it, self-published it. Um, and then really enjoyed the experience, but then was, I couldn't help but come back and to the idea of film because writing a novel is a very lonely (laughs) venture. Mm -hmm. And I love people talking with people, talking with experts, you know, especially people in a field that I have no technical, um, you know, uh, Sort of like ability. Yeah, 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 you know, um, point of reference for, right? And so 
I was like, well, if I can write a book, maybe I can direct a film. Yeah. And that, again, just planted the seed that led me to being here today. So, That's awesome. Yeah. And and I think it's it's not every day that you sort of go from serving, which is obviously a very it's a, it's a hectic career choice. Mm. And then you go into something more creative and then sort of like the parallels and, and kind of bringing those skills to yeah. filmmaking. So I, I'd really love to chat about sort of what from your experiences and your background was really useful when you first started making your short films and, and sort of, you know, what you took from one and brought to the other and sure. what could sort of help directors that are up and coming. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, you're right. I get that a lot. People go, wow, that's such a weird transition from uh, a, a it, strict though. military life to <laughs> a creative pursuit. And I go, yeah, well, like, that's just how I've grown and I, I love think it. it. I think it should be inspiring to any filmmaker 100%. that's out there. Because, I mean, like myself as well, I was a lawyer before. That doesn't mean just because you chose something in the past doesn't mean you can just completely switch and yeah. change it up. So I love it. James Cameron was a truck driver before he became a filmmaker, <laughs> you know, among many other jobs. But that's one of the more prominent ones. And and he's James Cameron, you know, yeah. what else has to be said? So, yeah, like and, and certainly something like in service, because service can be a bit of a bubble, knowing that you can transition out with a bit of planning and a bit of uh, research and, you know, you can't just wing it, but mm. it's 100% possible and, you know, very worthwhile. It's worked so far for me. Yeah. You know, we're at two years and counting so far. So we'll see where it goes. But, yeah, it's been it's been great. Um, but I guess, yeah, it's like this, but answer the, to answer your other question though, like, yeah, what I brought from those experiences into the film, I think is, uh, you know, like I said, like there's that 11 years of maturity and growth and, you know, all those sorts of things, which, you know, no, you can't get anywhere else other than just through time and experiencing things, yeah. um, which, you know, has naturally given me a, a you know, a, a boost to confidence and ability and just sort of like the understanding of like, just get it right. Like just do it, you know, and, and, um, own it. But yeah. I think something, um, and you, and you gotta love this. I thought of this last night, actually coming here. Like, uh, it's, it, I, I got an acronym for it. It's called feed. Okay, so, nice. so I'm saying I'm like trying to brand, I'm like, you know, <laughs> feed your leadership or feed your team. I don't know. But, um, these essentially are four pillars that I think are beneficial to any leader. Like we're talking about directing here. Cause that's sort of my, um, my main focus and sort of where I am in the industry. Yeah. But it can be applied to anyone in any position, whether you're a producer, a head of department, um, you know, any, anyone, anyone that sort of has like people that you need to talk to and, and, and not give orders to, but sort of like guide. That's right. Yeah. It, it, yeah, exactly. Because there's and directing in all departments as well. You 100%. know, like if you are a head of makeup, you're going to direct yeah. the people underneath. Well, and- director of photography, you know, exactly. it's in the name. So, um, yeah, so these four pillars, like, so I've put, I've boiled it down to these things. So, uh, first one is flexibility, the empathy, energy, and decisiveness. Okay. Those are four things that really kind of helped me um, mm-hmm. in, in my leadership time in, in defense and yeah. it's things that I brought with me uh, to here, which apply, I think, really, really well to a film set. So, yeah. um, you know, we can go through and we can talk about each one Let's of those and, and break it down, right? So um, the first one I do want to talk about, though, is decisiveness okay. um, because I think no matter what role you are in a leadership position, you know, or what capacity you're in, I think... A, leadership's, a leader's ability to be decisive is crucial, right? Because take a director, for example, when you're on the set and you're driving the production, you're the one that makes it go. And, you know, when you are indecisive and can't pick if you, well, you know, what shot you want or whatever the decision is, mm. um, the production gr- grinds to a halt. Yeah. And like, yes, you've got producers that, you know, they, they come in and, you know, they assist where you can and stuff like that. But we all know it's the director on the factory floor that makes that yes. um, that happen. And anyone, you know, certainly the people who have been on your podcast before who have been directors can 100% relate to that. Yeah. And so I think it goes back to the old adage of, you know, like just uh, a plan that's 50% but executed as a be- as a plan that's much better than um, as a hundred percent organized and never executed. So yeah. what I mean by that is, you for example, your DP comes up to you and sem- something as simple as okay, like what shot do we want for this? Do we want an A or do we want B? Yeah. <laughs> you know, your job as director, like, and and obviously this will be informed by your experience and your vision and your own preparation and planning. Um, 
But if you really are stuck, like just pick, it's 50, 50, just pick one. And then if you're, yeah. you've got a great head of department, they will then assist you in making that the best it can be. Because the worst thing you can do is make no decision and have people scratching their heads, having the production grind to a halt. And then potentially at worst case, having people question your ability that's it. And your leadership yeah. of the set, like, hang on, does this person actually know what they're doing? Yeah. Which, and, and you know. I've seen that happen before. 100%. Uh, from an actor's perspective, I think um, an, a director that, that isn't able to choose is a director that hasn't prepared enough um, in my, my personal experience. It's just like, you can just tell. Like, if a director is supposed to be guiding the vision and and sort of making sure that every puzzle piece is in play and is actually getting that script done and whatever, ex executing on the actual filmmaking process. If there are like uncertainties, you can probably deal with them. But as long as there mm. is decisiveness and they're able to go, okay, look, I'm not sure, but let's just put the camera here, test it out, and we can always change yeah. it. That's actually a better step forward than just like, oh gosh, I have no idea. Oh, and a lot of this, to be honest, happens when there's no storyboard. Right. There's no previous planning. Yeah. There's yeah. no shot list. So yeah, and again, like comes back to but um, experience will judge you. as well. Yeah, exactly. And that's and the main then they'll, thing. They'll Doesn't... leave. They'll leave the set and they'll go. Yeah. Oh, you know, X Y Z and didn't didn't do a great job. Like I didn't feel like I could actually yeah the set just was falling apart all and the time and that's what they will see it doesn't they don't care what happened behind the scenes like maybe that person was meant to do a shot list and they didn't it doesn't matter because you're the director and you're the like the buck stops with you and they're going to look at you and just think oh well like they, they obviously don't know what they're doing yeah. you know and that sucks you know I've, yeah. I've, I've, I've i have unfortunately been in that position you know and that's a, that's a really crappy thing to um, yes. uh, experience, you know, because then that affects trust and affects your reputation and things like that. And obviously, like, you know, I don't want to scare anyone, like, because people also, you know, will you know if you're- You somewhere. Yeah, that's right. They'll know if you're inexperienced or learning or, you know, you're, you're 17 and a half and you've just finished high school and you're, you know, like that, that's people, the, the good people will realize that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, which I guess sort of leads very neatly into empathy, mm, yeah. right? And empathy is like- is is a subject that's worth an entire podcast on its yes. own. Yes. Um, well, how would you sort of before you get kind of yeah. go into the guidance? What what would you say is sort of the definition of empathy in the context of filmmaking? Sure, well, and I mean, directing. Yeah, yeah. Like so, empathy is essentially like in a more general sense, right? It's it's about having, uh, if not an understanding, then at least an appreciation for a person's circumstances. Yeah. Um, and then applying that specifically to filmmaking. Uh, some kind of understanding of their craft, their position in the hierarchy, where they fit into the chain of creativity, all those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. You know, great directors like Christopher Nolan, we know, talk about the importance of knowing a little bit about all the jobs that go into film, you know. Yeah. You don't have to know everything, but just understand that, it's you know. high level. Yeah, the, for example, the editor's going to be pulling their hair out if you don't give them enough takes or whatever the case may be. Or, yeah. you know, you so... That, that's, I guess, like on a technical professional sense, but also like on a human level. Mm -hmm. Empathy is really important because we're all humans. We go through stuff. We are never the same each day, right? In some way we're different or circumstances change. Certainly the environment of the film set can change. And it's very important to remember that when things get pretty stressful and heated on a film set. And again, that's where directors, I think, and leaders need to sort of step up and I guess manage that and assist that, you know? And yeah. so something I like to do to that feeds into that is before every production I do uh, first day, or even, you know, my time, sometimes I might do it, you know, a few times if it's a longer production and more people come on board or whatever, mm -hmm. but I always get the team together, everyone cast and crew. Um, and I always just give a, a quick, like, Hey, um, just a reminder that, you know, what happens on the set stays on set. You know, things can get pretty spicy on here yeah. and they're going to be getting pretty stressed and things <laughs> won't work out. Um, don't hold it like one, don't hold that person personally account. Like, you know, it's not their personal fault. You know, yeah. it's not because they're a bad person or anything like that. It's just because, you know, we got to get a job done. But then also on the receiving end, if you're, you know, at the, if you're, you know, whatever, some the, the first ADs, having a go at you because you're being too slow, or whatever. Don't take that personally either because it's not because they don't like you. It's just yeah. because they really like this production and want it to be the best it can be. And so the, in that sense, empathy, I think, goes both ways. You know, you need to understand the people um, 
below you for a better term and the people above you, you know, just people you're talking to under, you know, remember that they are feeling, thinking humans that mm. are here because they have a passion, hopefully because they have a passion for the art form and they want to help you make uh, a great this vision movie. real life. Yeah. yeah, that's right. That's what it's all about. It's about making yeah. a great movie. And I think, Coming back to directors specifically, it's very important for the director to, one, have great empathetical thinking themselves, but also, two, to guide and shape the team to maintain that sense of thinking throughout the production, especially with, if it's a very long production. Yeah, for sure. 100% agree. With, with sort of like your background serving, did you have specific examples that sort of guided your learning on how to oh, be yeah. empathetic and then that sort of you brought that to the filmmaking process? Later? Yeah, 100%. I'd love to sort of like tie it back because yeah, it's such yeah, an interesting I mean, experience. So I can, um, and, and you know, anyone who's served, who's listening to this will 100% um, relate. When we go through officer training, for example, right, like we don't, just do officer specific training. We do everything right down to the low lowliest rifleman, the most junior rifleman in the platoon or the flight or whatever, right up to the platoon commander. So that mm. in that sense, you you do the job of the scout. You do the job of the signaler or the radio man. You do the job of the gunner. And everyone hates the gunner because you've got to carry around this big, great bloody thing that <laughs> oh, is God. super heavy and cumbersome and you got to fire and move it. It's, it, you know, it, it's it, especially, you know, um, it can be a pretty tough gig at times. But we do that, one, so we have a understanding of the functions of those people within the hierarchy. Yeah. But also, two, we can empathize and understand that, you know, when we tell them, the gunner to go up that great bloody hill that's, you know, on a steep incline to get you, up there they, and do it. Everyone knows what right? that feels like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, do it within two minutes. You kind of go, well, hang on a minute. I've done that and that sucks. Okay, maybe not two minutes, maybe five minutes or whatever, you know. And that's yeah. and that's the best kind of example, I think, of, of empathy in a, in a professional sense. So then applying that to filmmaking – you know, get the gaffer to go over there and redo that lighting right now because we're I shooting this thing right there. I was thinking right? that. You know, and I always, <laughs> I always like to talk about the gaffers because I feel like no one talks about the poor old gaffers because they got a lot of they equipment they got to so move much. around. And oh my gosh! How critical is? I mean, obviously everything's critical to film, but if the picture sucks, you know, that's the that's you know, without picture there is no film. You know, you might as yeah. well just do an audio drama or something. So getting the gaffer, you know, to pull down all that lighting and set it all up in the span of two minutes because we've got to get this thing done because of blah, blah, blah. And look, hey, sometimes, you know, stuff happens and you got to do it. But, you know, you, it should be the last resort to make someone do that. You should have an understanding that, you know, hey, the gaffer, they might only, it might only just be the gaffer, especially on these, you know, independent short films where we have small crews. Yeah, you crews. might only have one person that's doing all that and then yeah. they're moving all, and all the C-stands, all this, all yeah, that. Yeah, that takes time. And so you need to account for that into your planning and into your decision making. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, like, you know, like I said, there's a time where you just got to get on with it and sometimes it just sucks and it's yeah. hard work, but such is the nature of what we do. Oh um, so, right. And that's, and you know, and, and, you know, if you listen to this podcast, I, I imagine you have some understanding of that, right? <laughs> Otherwise you wouldn't be here. So, um, yeah. yeah. So that leads very nicely into energy. And I like talking about energy because I think it's something that in terms of just general leadership is something we don't, um, I don't know. So I feel like it's, it's never really in the spotlight because we sort of take it for granted. But what I mean by energy is that it's not just your quantity of energy, you know, feeling fatigued, but the nature of it that you bring to the set. So what do I mean by that? Well, um, it's a simple case of positivity. Mm. Like positivity, man, you got to have it, right? Because yeah. I've been on sets uh, where, the, you know, particularly the director, but anyone in a, in a kind of a leadership position that influences people has bad energy and it could be something as a bad attitude or they could be completely flustered or they could just be just sort of a doubting Thomas, like, oh, everything sucks and oh, nothing's working, nothing's working. Mm. Like, obviously we have those thoughts, you know, that's like I have that when I write a script, you know, we all have that, um, you know, those, those sort of conflicting thoughts, but it's about what you show on the outside. Again, as a director, right, you're, you might have, you, your brain is swimming with all sorts of crap, yeah. you know, <laughs> with stuff that's going wrong and this isn't there right? and, oh, wow, yeah. everything is going to custard. But um, it's very important that you p read the room and pick the audience that you present that to because obviously you've got to vent, but on a film set when things are happening, that is not the time. And so much of um, your energy and your attitude filters down to the rest of the crew. It so, does. Yeah. So if you're, a, 
you know, being negative and saying nothing's working, this is all bad and whatever, everyone else is going, well, if the director's thinking that, then, yeah, well, well, what the hell am I doing man, here then? The director is in charge of the vibe. They really are. Yeah. Because if, if you are sort of someone that's a bit more cynical, then it really does rub off on everyone else. Yeah. Because I think you need to be uplifting. Even if things aren't going your way, you just kind of have to be like, look, okay, we've had these problems, but we're going to make it work. Yeah. And, and I love being solution oriented. I hate being problem oriented. Yep. Like yep. there are people that I've worked with in the past that are just so negative. And I'm just like, guys, we're making a movie. Like mm -hmm. this should be really exciting. This yep. should be fun. This should, yep. yes, it's stressful, but like we're all coming together as creatives and we have to realize that the respect we give each other by by acknowledging each other's energies and and sort of like the efforts that we're putting in mm. that's going to turn into a much better director uh vibe that's sort of rubbing off to on everyone 100% like, yeah you, but they're like the the CEO of a company that's creating a culture it's the I, same thing exactly right yeah and and being you know a, a person that's just been you know the the grip or the the cable person you know like someone that you know you're not you're just sort of there you're part of the crew and you know just part of the one of the more like you know you know certainly one of the more laborious cogs in the machine mm -hmm. there's nothing better than when you're having a crap day and you think oh i'm so sick of carrying this camera or whatever <laughs> and but then you look at the director or or whoever it is your head of department or who if someone you're looking up that's managing the show and they are just full of life and fun and they are just having the time of their life and just really enjoying it yeah. genuinely and not putting it on like you know but like they, they are you just think oh well like I need to stop complaining then. Mm. It's, 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 it's amazing. Like it literally just, it's magic. It just yeah. changes. Um, it can completely enhance or ruin a set based on those things. So I think energy is very important. And, and a lot of the great directors I admire talk about, um, you know, having that energy and being, you know, full of it and running around like a, like a chihuahua, you know, like <laughs> doing all sorts of, you know, not, not stopping and just loving it. Um, and, and you might be thinking like, oh, that's pretty, that sounds really tough and hot. Yeah. Well, it is. <laughs> like yeah. that's, that's why um, it is. Yeah. I, I remember watching, uh, I think it was a behind the scenes on, I think it was Kill Bill or Hateful Eight or something. But yeah. it was like Quentin Tarantino always stops the set and once in a while and he's like, we're here because we love making movies. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. we're going to do one more take. Why? Because we love making movies. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and yeah. it's like, it's sort of, I, I love it. It's, it's, uh, it sort of gets everyone off their feet and exactly. kind of yelling out something brings the energies together. Yes. I actually really like that. I and think that's, that. I, I, it's something I, I think I want to, put into my own films yeah, and I you gotta should. come up with my own catchphrase uh, yep exactly <laughs> right like, and that's and that's you know as part of you know making a brand for yourself but like it, it also like you said it creates that reputation like how many yeah. people in Hollywood want to work with Tarantino mm. right like or have have spoken of great experiences with him and not just him but all the other great directors we all admire you know because yeah. they all in their own way carry that that energy so it's very that's very important um so Definitely, you know, when you're on a set and you're thinking, you know, yeah, like you know, Steven Spielberg and Stanley Kubrick. You know, I love Stanley Kubrick. Um, they talk. He, he Stanley, talks about. Although some people might not want. <laughs> yeah, no, of course, yeah, but I, hundred percent. He's 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 a he's a funny one. I said that's why I find him so fascinating. But yeah. I do. I think often of what Steven he said that Steven Spielberg said to him, which he said the hardest part of directing is getting out of the car because you got to psych yourself up and get into it, right? So, um, yeah. yeah, that's uh, so. Just remember that, you know. Get it all out in the car, get that bad energy out, and then get out of the car and attack it with with vigor and fun and make it an enjoyable experience How for everyone. How do you sort of keep the vibe good on your own film sets? Honestly, like like I said, I just I, – I've, I've always like – well, I mean, you know, it's probably no secret that I, I'm I'm crazy, right, and I'm just <laughs> running around doing stuff and talking my head off. But, like, so much of that is you – know, contributes to making that so. Mm -hmm. Having uh, just – uh, very active mindset, being there, being amongst it. Like mm -hmm. I think some of the, one of the most horrible decisions a director can make, and you know, this is just world according to Will, is remove themselves from the action, mm. you know, um, be in, you know, in, another script, room, in video like, town or yeah, whatever it is, you yeah. know, like uh, certainly uh, you, you got to be there and you got to be amongst it and you got to be enjoying it and loving it, you know, and so much of what I do that to enhance the scene of the set and the energy of the set is just, yeah, like being there, actively talking to everyone, you know, obviously positive reinforcement where required mm. um, and just 
like absorbing myself into the chaos of it. Yeah. I love that. I love the chaos. I love making decisions. So I don't mind when things go awry and people need to know what's going on. Like I love just, you know, dealing with those problems. And um, I think so much of that energy brushes off onto people and makes them go, right, well, okay, yeah. let's just, like, yeah, let's do it. You know, it's almost like a drug. You're just like, yeah. And then yeah. afterwards when the day of shooting is done, you're all exhausted. You're like, oh my gosh, how do we, how do we do that? Um, but that's one of the great benefits of filmmaking. That's, that's the joys yeah, of it. When you think, sure. how the heck did we do that? Well, somehow. And yeah. it looks great. Yeah. And I think the, the energy side of things is also so important when you're giving feedback as a yes. leader, you also have to give feedback to actors, your crew members. And, and personally, I love giving like shit sandwiches. Yeah. It's like, yeah. it's like you have good news, bad news, good news. Yeah. We always end on a high and always start with a high yeah. that's personally what i find has worked really really well 100 percent. and like you know i have I've, I've got leadership experience from more of a business side of things not so much sort of serving in the military and like all yeah that but stuff. it's all the but same it, but it's, it, it is very similar it does mm. cross over and i do find that when you are giving a giving feedback to a crew member if it's your gaffer if it's your actor mm. whoever i think that that the energy you bring to to that conversation is going to be so important and also you know empathy yeah, like yeah. you were mentioning so many elements of that sort of all comes together um yeah people will judge you based on how you give feedback as well 100 uh, percent. well here's here's a bonus one for you since you brought up feedback one thing i like to do i i give no more than three points mm. per feedback because okay. i know some you people overwhelm yeah exactly because when you have an actor and they might have just you know done a really great performance or they might have not done the performance you're looking for it's very important that you do not just bombard them with seventeen thousand points of improvement <laughs> because then they go well how the heck do i focus yeah. what do i what do i do this all at worst case they might go wow i am that this bad at it i just yeah, should give up so certainly limit the amount of points and feedback you give. And that's why, yeah, like the shit sandwich or um, the bathtub method is the what they the way they teach it in defense. Yeah. What's the bathtub? Same method? thing. Yeah, it's like, you know, because you start up and then you go down into the bath and then you go up again. Oh. So it's like the shape of a bathtub. Same yeah. thing, positive, negative, positive. Um, so certainly I, I like to land on a positive note as well because I think the last thing you tell someone is what they remember the most. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you got to, and this is, it comes back to the decisiveness of a director, you got to know, um, who you're dealing with, you got to read the room, and you got to at the end of the day, you got to uh, get what you need. You got to yeah. get the performance because if you if there is bad acting in a film, it is 100 percent the director's fault. Yeah, I, straight up. Thank you. That yeah. is so true. It is, it is because it is the director is the one. The, act, the director's yeah. fault, exact because it because you move on. That's right. The director you, goes. You yeah, would, we got it. You would never move on if if you were like actually in charge of that and you were happy with the actual shot. So yeah. if 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 a bad acting piece is in the movie, it's because they they decided to move on too quick and they knew they didn't have the shot, they knew they didn't have the right acting. Yeah. And just went went, yep, we yep. got it. Great job. High five yep. each other, moved on. And, it, and it's not the editor's fault either, because if you've got a good editor, they will put the best acting in, you know. So it, it honestly, yeah, I, I I genuinely think that. So which was a bit of tidbit that was given to me uh, from one of my film school teachers. So yeah. Um, but anyway, final, the, the last point, I'll quickly touch on the last point, which was yep. flexibility, mm. which it says it all. You need to have that in this industry. But as a director, particularly if you're a writer director or vice versa, if you are a director who is adapting uh, or directing the screenplay written by another writer mm. or even, you know, like I said, even if you're a writer particularly that is written a screenplay going to another. And I know one of your other um guests have spoken about this, but that's one example of that. You need to be able to obviously have a vision, have a plan, have prep, do not skimp out on prep time. Um, you know, storyboards, all that stuff, do it all. But then understand that none of it will come to fruition in the way exactly the way you want. Like they, yeah. they, there's a saying in the in in the fence, they say like no plan survives first contact. And what that means is like you can have a great tactical plan where yeah. you're going to flank the enemy and do blah, 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 blah. And then it all goes to custard once the first shot rings out because maybe, you know, that person you needed to flank is, is, is you know, pinned down or whatever mm. the case may be or the radio doesn't work or something just untoward happens. Right. Um, and that is just so true for the film industry. And when you're the director in that hot seat, when everyone's coming to you with decisions and like, you know, okay, maybe you got a decision 
between the one that you originally thought and uh, an alternative one. And that's great because you can go with the one that you wanted to. But then when you don't have any decision that fits to your original vision, you yeah. got to un- yeah, be you, flexible. Yeah. And you got to go, right, I've got to still pick one. And again, it just, and sometimes you just know, and sometimes you just don't know and you, and, and you make a mistake and that's just how it goes. But um, the fact is you, you need to be flexible enough to, identify that and make the right decision and find the right course of action to go forth. Or, you know, even something as simple as, well, not as simple, but something like your location you wanted to use can't be used today because it's outside and it's, it's pouring down and it's not really yeah. pouring down in the script. So you got to, all right, well, well crap, we've got a whole day of shooting here. Everyone's here. What can we do? All right. Well, you have to be try and be flexible and find a way um, to maximize that time. And you might have a backup plan. You might yeah. not, but you need to, and this is, and this is where having a great team helps, and having the right team helps. Um, you need to be, you need to have a flexible plan to maximize on your time and your resources and your money for shooting. I think the ability to think on your feet is like super important as a director. Yeah, yeah. Because like when you think about it, I mean, it kind of sounds like we've got this endless list of of things that directors need to be doing, right? right. There's there's heaps of stuff. It's long. You have to you have to pretty much take care of all these people. You have to make sure that your vision gets translated and sort of you have to tell everyone what you want. And sometimes there can be a lot on your on a director's plate, so you know, on their shoulders. And I think the ability to think fast on your feet, I think, is probably the number one skill yeah. to have because if you don't get super overwhelmed or stressed by something going wrong, yeah. then you can have that flexibility yeah. you can have that empathy you can have the energy it all comes it all crumbling comes, down yeah but if you can sort of think on your feet and kind of go okay it's raining what are we going to do okay mm-hmm. um maybe someone go and grab like 10 umbrellas and we'll change the vibe of the scene a little bit yeah. but maybe that'll work or, or maybe like all right too bad it is raining now in the scene let's roll with it you know yeah exactly or or oh, actually, there, there. Let, let's let's try and find a tunnel somewhere, like, mm-hmm, or mm-hmm. let's find a, a place that that is undercover. Or maybe we can add into the story that the yeah. characters get rained on and they rush into another location. Yeah, like these are the types of things that that really help. A really great example. So for my first short film, we had to create a sort of like a car accident scene. Right. And we had scoped a location in sort of like this roundabout area that was very private mm. near a university. We went there on on like a, a the same sort of night that we would be shooting at. So if it was a Thursday, we went on a Thursday and at the right time, everything literally where we would sort of plan the call sheets around and whatever. Anyways, it was dead. Nothing. No cars, no bicycles, no, no foot traffic, nothing. Mm-hmm. So we're like, sweet, this is awesome. We're totally going to be able to film it here and we'll mm-hmm. have all of this sort of stuff coming coming around and it's going to be great there's going to be no problems here mm. and then what happens when we rock, when we rock up there on shoot day it's the busiest it's ever been oh no and that was really tough because we had to sort of really shift things around yeah but if i was a director that sort of was like bummed by that and sort of like you know got sort of fed up with it and decided to cancel a shoot or whatever mm. i don't know if that short film would have come to life 100 percent but what happened was we thought quick on our feet. And what we did was we we got a couple extra hands to like hold these sort of lights. Mm-hmm. And in a way, like the foot traffic and, and all of that busyness sort of added a bit more to the scene because it was so chaotic that mm-hmm. it made all the actors also feel super chaotic. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it sort of really brought to the vibe. And what we would do was we would carry the lights out onto the street, quickly get the car to come down. Um, try as quick as we can and, and then rush back out. It felt like a Formula One tire change, but we rolled with it. <laughs> yeah. And the end result was pretty damn good. Great. We could have given up on that oh, and yeah. sort of, you know, the film could have just gone down the drain. Yeah. hundred and, and, you know, that is what makes or breaks anyone in the film industry, you know, yeah. is that critical decision point of do I press on through the chaos or do I, you know, call it quits, mm. you know, and... The, Never you, give up. No, don't quit. Don't do it. Just power through. Even if it's not what you wanted, it's something. And something's better than quitting, right? So, yeah. Um, yeah. So, all those things, yeah. Like being, And that's a great example of flexibility. You know, like you just, all right, it's not what I wanted or whatever. Okay, but, you know, like what Michael Caine says, how can we use the difficulty? And I think that's a great way of, um, you know, summing up flexibility. I'm not going to steal his thunder. Go look up an interview of him saying it. It's brilliant. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, that's something to keep in mind. Um, yeah. yeah. So, you know, I guess just, yeah, just quickly recap. So it's flexibility, 
empathy, energy, and decisiveness. Um, you know, if you remember those four things, I think you're pretty good. And also if you're not a director and you're someone that's working for a director, as you alluded to earlier, bring them solutions. Don't just bring them problems, bring them solutions because so much of a director's ability is built on having a, a great team. So be yeah. a great team person and bring a solution to a director and then let them make the decision. They're the director, you know, just give them a list of things and options. And it, trust me, it just, it helps immensely. So if you're listening to this and that's what you, a you know, position you're in, do it. It, yeah. it. it helps so much. Oh my gosh. So much. So we, I want to, I want to now chat about kind of more the difficult side of things, right? Yeah, like sure. there's always challenges. There's always things that kind of go wrong, mm. but I, I want to take it um, down different paths. Sure. So my first question is really based on sort of your serving experience there would have been incredibly stressful periods where probably you 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 would have had to sort of set expectations and sort of guide the the team to make sure that their head was still in the game. Yep. Um, what is there anything like that for your in your own experience when it comes to the filmmaking process? Mm -hmm. Where at the start of the filmmaking process, maybe on day one of the of filming or even down the track, you've had to sort of take that sort of experience mm. and bring that in mm -hmm. yeah well, i mean like a great uh source of difficulty for any new commander in a defense unit especially a junior officer coming into something like a rifle flight which is what i did mm -hmm. is knowing that you are green as grass you don't know how things work you think you do but you don't mm. and then being in thrust into a position where you are then expected to command and order about um, men and women who are in, inordinately more experienced than you. Yeah. You know, they've been in for 20 years or 10 years or five years and you've been in for one, for example. Mm. And that that's intimidating because you're like, oh, my gosh, like how can I get – like maybe I, you think you know things and you, you have a that sounds one like, that first conversation with them. You're like, oh, my God, I don't know anything. Sounds like imposter syndrome a little bit. <laughs> yeah, it does, a little bit, yeah. And so in that sense, I think for a director, like even if you've done some time in, um, on, on cruise or cruise sets and stuff – um, that can still hit you and you're like, oh my gosh, what do I do? Like, mm. you know, um, and my way of overcoming that, which we, again, we, we get sort of, uh, we got taught to do this is to, again, like use the expertise of those people you're working with to your advantage yeah. and to shape your own decisions and to shape your image as a decision maker and a leader. Right. So um, to go look at defense, for example, like when I had my first posting, I had a great sergeant. And I, you know, I, I didn't know how to do some things. And it's always, I think it's a great strength to admit to the right people. You don't know what you're doing. Yeah. There's no shame in it. Like it's, a, it's, you just say, hey, it's my first day. And the, again, the great people will go, right. That's cool. You're, yeah. My sergeant said to me, he said, you're a sponge. He said, you're just a sponge. Just absorb everything that you see and, 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 and do. Um, and I learned so much because I'd be like, okay, what, what, you know, I'm thinking of this or this, what do you think? And he goes, well, in my experience, blah, 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 blah. Mm. Um, and that overcomes so many difficult situations and uh, like prevents that indecisiveness. So when you come to a film set, it's a similar thing. Um, I don't know the ins and outs of camera work. Yeah. Um, in fact, I probably don't know a lot about filmmaking compared to some other people that you've had on this podcast, right? I'm yeah. new to this. Um, but I know my vision and, you know, great, again, directors like Tarantino talk about it. Um, you know, know your, you know, don't need to know the technicalities, know your vision. Well, what does that actually look like on set though? That looks like going to your DP and going, right, I, uh, I need to, what, what we call asking for an effect. So you don't necessarily go to the DP and say, for this shot, I want a, you know, double, dirty, dirty double with an over the shoulder, blah, 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 this lens. I mean, you can if you want, but like, again, it depends on your relationship. But yeah. I find it's much more uh, efficient and effective to say to your DP then, all right, this is an intimate scene where we need to capture the heartbreak of these people because they've just had this great realize, uh, revelation about blah, 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 blah. And then, yeah. then, the, and then the good DPs will go, all right, I know exactly what I need to do. That's going to be a this, this, and then they go, come back and go, here's what we got. And you go, yep, bang, I love that. And then yes. the best thing is, is that when that all goes through, it makes it look like you know what you're doing. Yeah. Right? And people go, wow, that's really cool. Yeah, um, I, totally. I think half the job of a director is to to get the right people on board. Because, yes. Because, like, it's something I I really want, try to do as much as I can because I don't know it all. And I'm happy to admit that. And when, you, when you're on set and you have someone that has experience as, as a cinematographer, that has experience as lighting, someone that has experience with sound, 
all of a sudden you don't need to know as much anymore and you can kind of trust in them. Mm. I think people need to trust more in general. Um, 100%. And it's not just filmmaking. I think it, yeah. it applies to so many other things. I think sometimes we think we can we're the smartest or whatever you feel like sure. you should have your hands in everything yep 100 i'm very guilty of that where like i kind of have a bit of that sort of ocd of of like oh i ever it, it's only going to be best if it's me that does yeah, it but yeah you need to just kind of like let that go a little bit yeah because you'll go so, nuts otherwise trying to do yeah. all that and the and production think, will suffer and i think when you create a storyboard as a director you don't really know exactly like what would be the best thing in that certain situation. Like if you want to, yeah. if you want to have that intimate scene or if you want to have a uh, sort of more of a unnerving sort of style, mm -hmm. then on the day you can ask your cinematographer, look, this is what I'm thinking, yeah. but what do you think? Yeah. You know, let, let's, let's, let's come find an in-between maybe where the yeah. two minds can kind of meet and create something way better because yeah. the cinematographer has done six horror films before they're going to yep. know what to do. And they're artists as well with thinking, creative brains that want to apply their own art form and their own signature to the piece, you know, and also the same with actors, you know, you need to um, almost as a director, like empower them and, and use that as leverage for your own creative decision making. Yeah. Um, because, you know, yeah, you don't have all the answers and sometimes the best things to do is, and that's what we say, that's why we call it asking for an effect, you know, you don't need to actually get into the weeds of the technicalities of it. I mean, maybe you can if you want to. Like I yeah. said, it depends on your relationship. But as a general rule, you ask for that effect, that more general effect um, and that intention toward the vision and then let those artists then, like, again, you've got them on your team, so they must be pretty good. Let them decide that and 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 give you um, the, you know, let them achieve your vision through yeah. their own creative process and that's and that's why i love filmmaking it's so great watching experts work like that yeah you know so um asking for effect it it 100 it just works every time it really does i love it um yeah and that's where you, that's where the happy surprises happen yeah which i also love <laughs> yeah so. i think when you empower your team you can you you get you just get so much more out of it mm. you know you, you're literally like squeezing every little bit you can and it it will make the production so much better yeah um like for example, if you empower your team to create like a, a design for for this specific room, for example, mm. in this scene you need it to be this this and that, and you sort of this sort of energy, this sort of vibe, and then you sort of empower everyone to kind of be like, okay, this is sort of what I'm going for, but you give them a little bit creative freedom. Mm -hmm. People love that, yeah, because you still know what you want, you have a vision, but you're not like a vision Nazi, like you're Man. kind of you're still allowing a little bit of freedom, a little bit of movement. Yep. And then I think when, when, when they sort of present whatever they've come up with and you sort of give them like a shit sandwich or you mm -hmm. give them like that positive remark because mm -hmm. you're like actually impressed with their work, which is more likely to happen because you've given them a little bit of freedom mm -hmm. to think for themselves. I think it just sets up great energy for the remainder of the, the shoot as well for sure so there's like so many benefits for yeah. being a leader that actually isn't so much of like i'm the leader mm. it's like i'm i'm the family pack leader that's right but we're all a family that is working on this together yeah and everyone's input still does matter yeah you're like your role as director is is as much as empowering your team as well as directing the team i think so yeah. and at the end of the day like you know if you're team goes off and does something like, okay, I'll give it a crack. So do it your way. Yeah. Um, the worst that can happen is you just go, yeah, it's cool, but not what I'm after. Let's just, <laughs> let's go back to this other way. And yeah. that's fine then. Like, that's cool. That's part of it. They're like, and if they're professional, they'll go, yep. Yeah, okay, cool. Great. We'll do that. But certainly, yeah. And the time it takes to talk about it, like just film the damn thing. Yeah. Just film it. Who it cares? Just do, just do it. Just get it on there. We bet we don't use celluloid much these days. It's all digital. So just whack it on there and you know, if you use it, you use it. If you don't, you don't, who cares, but it's there. So that's it. I, I want you to, to give us a little bit of advice. So back, whether it is from your, your background in defense or whether it is from making your own films so far, what can a young filmmaker do today to perhaps start their leadership journey in the sure. right way? Well, like I said, like the best thing is just uh, to just go out in life and experience things, try things, interact with um, various different kinds of teams, look at uh, how other 
great people you admire. It don't have to be filmmakers, just people mm. that you admire and how they, you know, it could be Steve Jobs, for example, who knows, but like someone that uh, inspires people and, and, and leads people successfully and just sort of like listen to what they have to say. And I'm not going to yeah. say like, you know, like don't have to do a leadership course or anything, but just yeah. see like how they speak of their team, how they speak of their vision um, and absorb that. And that's where, you know, that's where you need to be a sponge and do that. And then once you, uh, you know, I've, I've done a bit of that and um, experienced it, it just comes to the point where you just got to uh, look for that opportunity or create that opportunity to throw yourself into that position, into that role and do it. So in terms of directing, yeah, you know, write a film, you know, it doesn't have to be a big film. You can just like, you know, it can be a two minute silent film yeah. um, or, you know, maybe you might know a writer who has a cool little script they want to try and make into a movie or whatever it is, make, find that community and then thrust yourself into that leadership position as a director uh, and go, right, like, and put yourself into a position where you have to make decisions yeah. and, and challenge yourself. Don't shy away from difficult situations, you know, um, in, and certainly filming a short film over a, a, a weekend, if you've never done it before, is challenging in itself. Yeah. Um, so, you know, give yourself though, like, so equip yourself with that knowledge, find that opportunity and then execute it and um, see what happens. And then, Hey, if you make a mistake, doesn't matter. That's part of it. You can fix it. it in the next one. Yeah. That's I'll the just, thing. You I'll, get better with practice. Yeah. I'll, I'll quickly add in a quote. Like Kobe Bryant says, um, you know, d worrying about doubt is pointless because if you're, uh, you know, if you succeed, that's great. But then you have to get up the next day and do the whole journey again. If you fail, that sucks. But then you've got to get up and do the whole journey all over again. So yeah. doubting and worrying about doubt and what you're going to do is pointless. Just get in and, and just give it your all and learn. I love that. Willem, where can people find you and what have you got coming up next? Yeah, sure. So I have a humble little Instagram uh, called Film with Willem. Uh, and I also have a TikTok, which I occasionally put things up on. Love so um, I've got all sorts of cool little photos from, you know, film sets and other creative pursuits. Um, I've got a short film that I'm making later in the year, which is going to be really great, uh, called Sweet Cake. And I've also uh, got uh, an animation project in the works, which is going to be very exciting. So um, you can see some of the uh, artwork and things like that on the Instagram. So yeah, uh, cool. give me a follow and uh, reach out anytime. I love meeting new people. Hell yes. Well, thank you so much, Willem, for joining us on this episode. It was so good My getting pleasure. to know your your background. It was, it was great. Yeah. And for all the filmmakers listening, um, practice those leadership skills. They're very, very handy. And don't be afraid to, to fail. This was Creative Constitution, and we'll see you in the next one. Bye.